What's up guys, Dalmater here, and today we are going to be reacting to another Linfamy video. We're on part 3 of the Hogan Rebellion, which is part 29 of his History of Japan. Uh, and this is how do you defend, how do you defend when the rest of the country attacks you? Uh, so obviously we've been watching this. It's basically, you know, the Imperial fam, it's the Imperial family versus the Fujiwaras, right? The Imperial family wants to maintain control. Uh, the Fujiwara wants to basically become... No, they, they basically want to be in charge of the Imperial family, right? The Fujiwaras want to control the Imperial family and basically have them be, like, kind of their puppets. Uh, and then you have different clans that are fighting on different sides. In fact, some Fujiwara are fighting on the Imperial side. You have a bunch of the uh, warrior castes, I guess you could call them, warrior clans uh, that are on different sides. But the interesting thing is the Imperial family is basically, uh, other than the Fujiwara members of the Imperial family, it is basically, like, the rightful heirs to those different clans and then on the other side, you have the, the main Fujiwara branch, but then you have, like, the right, the uh, the people who would be second in command to a lot of these other clans, or, you know, second in line. Uh, and basically, it, a lot of it, it comes down to, like, I guess you could say, like, a civil war within a civil war, where all these clans are having, like, a civil war within themselves in the in, in this civil war, uh, in order to see, you know, who maintains power. Because, it, you know, if you win on the Fujiwara side, the Fujiwaras get to, you know, basically rule over the royal family and make the royal family their puppets. All these other second commands in these clans get to now be the main person in the clan. Everyone over here is trying to maintain the status quo uh, or reestablish, I guess, a former status quo to a certain degree. Um, but anyway, link to the original video down below and let's jump into it. Word into the sky, smoke burned his nostrils. The enemy had succeeded in setting the palace walls alight. It seemed all was lost. Alright you guys, this is the last video in the Hogan Rebellion series. A year after ex-Emperor Toba put Emperor Go Shirakawa on the throne, Toba died. Go Shirakawa wasted no time. Remember that a feud had been brewing in the Heian court for a while between the Imperial faction, Go Shirakawa's faction, and the Fujiwara Regency faction, ex-Emperor Stoko's faction. Yeah, you so as you can see here, you have ex-Emperor versus ex-Emperor, right? And a big factor here, which you mentioned in the other video if you haven't seen it yet, is that um, the, the emperors were basically using other people as puppets, right? So you would have, like, the father, as soon as he had a son that was, like, old enough to, like, you know, rule, he would step back and allow his son to rule, but he would actually be the one doing everything from behind the scenes. Um, but then a lot of the time, the son would do that when he had a son, so the, really the grandfather was in charge of the son who was in charge of the grandson, but the, the grandson is technically the emperor because the other people had, you know... Uh, given up their claim, but they were still in charge, right? So you have, uh, in this case, you have the grandfather and the father fighting each other, I believe it is, or maybe it's the uncle, and the, I, can't, I can't remember exactly which relation they are. But then you see here, you have the Fujiwaras, you have the Minamotos, and you have the Tairas, right? So it's literally one side of the family, right? One side of the, the Imperial family, Fujiwara, Minamoto, Taira. The other side of the Imperial family, Fujiwara, Minamoto, Taira. You don't need to memorize all these names for the test, but if you look at their clan names, you had Fujiwara versus Fujiwara, Taira versus Taira, and Minamoto versus Minamoto. It was people of the same family fighting yep. each other, brother against brother, father against son. After Toba died, Go Shirakawa immediately banned key members of the Fujiwara Regency faction from raising military troops, then ordered the capture of Fujiwara no Yorinaga's residence. We can see that everyone expected shenanigans after Toba's death. Retired Emperor Stoku of the Fujiwara Regency faction called his banners to his palace to defend him. Poor Stoku though, sometimes the banners you order are not the banners you get. He got itty bitty banners. The armies that came were tiny. You see, back then they didn't have huge standing armies trained and ready for battle when the call came. Warlords had to go around convincing local warbands and groups to join. Yeah, and, and you see this throughout, like, a lot of, like, the massive armies really didn't begin to exist until, like, the, to some degree, the 1700s, but really the 18 and 1900s, right? Um, prior to that, most societies had essentially a warrior caste within their society, um, and these people would be trained from birth to be warriors. And, you know, in, in Europe, for example, a lot of these people would go on to become the aristocracy and the nobility, especially, you know, after the fall of the Roman Empire, when the Germanic warriors took over everywhere. Um, you would basically see, like, the royal, the royals and the nobility of all these different areas 
uh, being raised to fight. And this is, you know, the, the kind of the area, the era of like the general kings and the general nobles, right? Where the king would be on the front lines fighting with his troops because he was from the warrior aristocracy. And you see this a lot. And then what tends to happen in a lot of the societies, which I've talked about in other videos, is a lot of these, you know, warrior castes, after they gain political power and secular power, they tend to become more decadent and then eventually either be conquered by a warrior caste from like an outside tribe, right? In the case of like what happened with Rome with the Germanic warriors conquering them. Or a new caste will be built within that, right? They'll start hiring slash training maybe more minor nobles or maybe just people that weren't even from the nobility at all. But yeah, a lot like armies at this point were largely made up of people who have been training more or less since birth because of which family they were born into to be warriors. Join their cause. The Fujiwara Regency faction went around doing this, but they were clearly the underdogs. Usually you like rooting for the underdog, but risking your life for the underdog is a different story. They had a hard time finding supporters. So ex-Emperor Stoku's allies gathered at his palace with a tiny force, and Emperor Go Shirakawa's imperial allies gathered at another palace nearby with Sauron's freaking army. <laughs> it was warriors from all over Japan ready to demolish the pathetic defenders at Helm's Deep. I mean, Stoku's palace. Now, the defenders actually had a legendary figure on their side. Their military leader, Minamoto no Tameyoshi, had a son named Minamoto no Tametomo. Tametomo was their Legolas, a legendary archer who will never ever date you, Jenny. They said he once <laughs> sunk a ship with a single arrow. They said his left arm was a few inches longer than his right, allowing him to draw his bow further than the average person. And the funny thing is that that is actually somewhat, you even see this in MLB pictures. Um, a lot of that has to do with just doing it from when you're a young age. You, uh, it's common in like a lot of different athletes. Probably the most famous examples are MLB pitchers. Um, but that just like that kind of goes to prove my point. Like he was, you know, trained since he was a young age to be this warrior. Um, it's you know he's kind of using that as like a unique point here, but it's it's not as unique as he thinks. Um, you know, if you look into like sports science or stuff, it's, uh, I used to work in. I've mentioned this multiple times. I used to work in an MMA gym, so I'm like very familiar with a lot of the sports science stuff. People who train from young age can actually have, you know, if they overdevelop one arm compared to the other, they can have like an, a, a limb that is, you know, sometimes inches longer than the other. So, yeah, he was basically using one arm for archery all the time, and it showed after years and years to the point where, like, you know, literally through his development. To scratch his back more easily, which is critical in battle. There are a bunch of folk tales about this guy. That's not ex emperor. That, Stok that's probably not even a folk tale. The length of the arm. That's again pretty common for even elite athletes today. Goku's war council was discussing what to do. Tametomo feared a night attack from the imperial forces, so he suggested they immediately strike first, attack the imperials at night in their palace, catch them off guard. Tametomo and his allies at the table may be constipated with desperation but perhaps they could squeeze out a victory in the end. However, Fujiwara no Yorinaga overruled him. He said it was dishonorable to fight in such a sneaky way. As an alternative, he laid out his genius plan to let the imperial forces come, and then both armies would commence the battle in one glorious charge. For some... <laughs> what, he learned that from European medieval fucking strategy? I know that's it's kind of a meme and overplayed and not entirely true, but... Honor in battle is always one thing I find like absolutely fascinating. Like, just like the code of ethics that people have around like fighting. It's like sometimes you don't fight to win; you fight to be honorable. I just find it kind of weird. For some reason the war council deferred to Yorinaga's stupid plan and scrapped the plan to strike first. Then that very night, the imperial forces did a surprise attack at night, striking first. Yorinaga said, "Huh." Imperial troops charged towards one of the gates of the palace. So historical details about the coming battle is scant. Most of our info comes from the Hogeng Monogatari, which was a story, a historical dramatization. Like watching a movie based on a true story, you can't trust everything in it. For example, troop size. The imperial forces overwhelmed the Fujiwara Regency forces, but how big was that army? The Hogeng Monogatari says, 4,500 men. Back then, the main warriors in the field were mounted archers. Each warrior usually had one or two accompanying foot soldiers or helpers. 
the 4,500 number only counts the mounted warriors, so if you add in their groupies, the Imperial Army was probably around 13,000, but this number was most likely an exaggeration. Among other things, the palace where they fought at was way too small for so many people. Luckily, we do have another source, a diary belonging to the Minister of War. He said they had 600 horsemen. Add in the groupies and you get about 2,000 men, which is probably more accurate. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, you know, a lot, one, there's, you know, you're talking about like a fictional story. Well, a, technically not a fictional story, right? Like it's a real story, but a fictional retelling of that story uh, versus a diary. I'd be more likely to agree with the diary. When it comes to the fictional version of the story, though, it's interesting because on one hand, right, you want everyone to seem like, you know, this story is probably created partially for propaganda purposes, right? I would imagine. I'm not entirely sure. But you would, you would want to make your army seem smaller. That way your warriors seem better and more heroic. But at the same time, you also want your army to seem bigger because it shows, like, how many men you can muster and how, like, everyone wanted to rally to your side to show, you know, support for the true emperor and stuff like that, right? So it's – there's kind of like these – you know, which one do you value more in your propaganda? Um, or, you know, it could have just been that, that big number sounds interesting for storytelling. It could have just been that, right? Something simple and more mundane and innocuous. That's a pretty small force for an imperial army made of people from all over the country. And the other side was even smaller. This gives us a sense of what warfare was like in the Heian days. Mounted warriors in small units. This was a major battle, so regular bite-sized battles must have been tiny. The Hogen Monogatari also has soldiers do I think a lot of people don't realize how small the population was back then. Like, go look at like a major city in Europe and look at like the population over time period in history. Uh, I think it was like a, around like the 1500s or so, maybe a little bit before that, but London was at like 50,000 people. Uh, it might have been a little bit before that, it might have been like more like 1300s, but... A lot of people think like populations back in ancient times were like massive, like almost to the same scale they are now. Not usually. Like there were some periods in history, like the Roman Empire, uh, Rome at the height of the Roman Empire, I think had around two million people. But that was like incredibly, incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, most cities were nowhere near that amount of population until like the beginning of like the Industrial Revolution and stuff do this funny thing. In battle, a warrior would proudly call out his name and titles and accomplishments, then choose an opposing warrior to fight a duel with. This contributed to the idea that samurai fought in duels. A battlefield was a bunch of men yelling out their names, challenging each other, and engaging in one-on-one -on -one archery duels. Like everything you learn in high school history class, this was BS. In the chaos of battle, no one's going to hear you talk. No one's going to stand and watch you give a speech about yourself. They'd rather watch their arrow go through your face. The reason this happens in the Hogeng Monogatari and other similar texts was probably because it was a literary device to introduce or familiarize a character to yeah. the reader. They didn't actually fight in duels for honor or whatever. So, Imperial Troop... I think if it's anything like today, although maybe this is just me talking out my ass. I don't know how... Um, you know, how much of a link there was between, like, the writers and the warriors at the time. But if it's anything like today, when it comes to, like, fight scenes, for example, in movies, as someone who coached MMA, I can tell you most fight scenes in movies are fucking horrible because they were written by people who have clearly never been in a fight in their life. And they have, like, the most delusional view of, like, what happens in a fight. Soldiers who came from all across the country attacked one of the gates of the palace. Minamoto no Tametomo, our legendary archer, led the defense of this gate. He rode around yelling his name, and his enemies responded with Hah! as his arrows met their eyeballs. It seemed like the defense was going really well, but things started going downhill. Fujiwara no Yorinaga, the guy who vetoed the first strike night attack plan, received a serious arrow wound to match the wound to his ego. The attackers were having a hard time so they decided to burn down the palace complex. Tametomo saw it. Flames rained upward into the sky. Smoke burned his nostrils. The enemy had succeeded in setting the palace walls alight. It seemed all was lost. So, what do you do when the rest of the country attacks you? You run. Tametomo and his men fled, along with ex-emperor Stoku and his allies. The entire palace burned down. 
The Imperials had won. The Hogang Rebellion lasted one battle, a few hours. The Fujiwara Regency traitors did not fare well afterwards. Fujiwara no Yorinaga, the stupid who said they shouldn't have attacked at night first, died from his arrow wound. <laughs> Ex-Emperor Stoku was exiled from the capital and died in exile, far away from the chrysanthemum throne that he yearned for. After he died, a story arose about him becoming a ghost, returning to seek vengeance upon the country that wronged him. I did a video about Stoku's ghost. Check it out. Whether you're into, I don't really know if you can say it wronged him, right? Like, I mean, he tried to take. I guess it really depends on like who do you think should, yeah, because it's like ex emperor versus ex emperor. I mean, technically neither one of them should be in power, and they're both kind of fighting just to control the puppet emperor. Um, I don't know if you can say that wronged him. Then right? it's kind of yeah. Plus, they cut the tendons in his left arm to negate his bow powers and banished him to a faraway place. God there, damn. he eventually committed ritual suicide, the first recorded act of seppuku. Some of Stoku's allies were executed. The executions See, caused the a big do that ruckus now? in court because the court hadn't officially ordered an execution in a long time. It preferred exile. The two victorious warriors whose names would be heard for years to come were Minamoto no Yoshitomo, who led the attack, and Taira no Kiyomori. Yoshitomo's father, Tameyoshi, had fought for the losing side, but Yoshitomo was still a son and pled for his father's life. Emperor Goshirokawa did not relent, and in the end, Yoshitomo had to give the order to execute his own father. Taira no Kiyomori faced a similar situation and had to execute his own uncle. The win cemented Emperor Goshirokawa's power and devastated the Fujiwara clan. Goshirokawa abdicated the throne to control the courts as a- Man, that dude has one flathead. He looks like those, uh, you ever seen those videos of streamers when they take their fucking- uh, headphones off and they have like the fucking dents in their head. That's what he looks like. A retired emperor and would exert power over multiple consecutive sitting emperors. But how the two warriors, Yoshitomo and Kiyomori, were treated would have a huge effect on the future of the country. The court rewarded the two for their service, but not equally. Yoshitomo, who had organized the attack, got a promotion and a government position. The provisional nice. head of the left house guards. It was okay, but Kiyomori was promoted to a higher rank and became the governor of Harima province, a huge boost to his income. The courts favored the Taira, you see. Yoshitomo and his followers were not happy. The Minamoto had lost their place as the top warriors of the land. This started a bloody rivalry between the Taira and Minamoto clans. The Hogan Rebellion was a key event where court politics was resolved not by plans and schemes, but by the bows and spears of the warrior clans. It was a sign of where the country was heading. A rising warrior class meant that the relative peace of the Heian period was coming to an end. All right, congrats to user Mana. Eat yeah, as much it's also it's it's I wouldn't say it's so much a rising warrior class as a switch from one to another, right? Which is kind of what I was saying earlier. Um, but yeah, you know, you're starting to have the beginning of the shogunate, which will then go on to rule Japan for, in one way or another, seven eight hundred years. Um, but anyway. That really interesting video. Uh, the next one is Who Were the Imishi, the Barbarians in Japan? We're part 50, I think out of 87, so we're well over halfway. Um, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.